Good morning. There we are, we're on. We are going to stand and we are going to um, sing praise to God as we start our meeting this morning. So if you want to grab a seat, if you want to stand, um, we're going to get going um, together. remain standing if you can we're going to sing again in a moment you are the God who saves us worthy of all our praises let me read from Psalm 95 then bring us before God in prayer come let us sing for joy to the Lord let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song for the Lord is the great God the great king above all gods in his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, our Lord, the rock of our salvation, we come to you now as we look ahead to the rest of this service. We thank you that we can proclaim the wonderful truth that we are your people, that we are the sheep and you are our shepherd. We don't deserve your love. We don't deserve to know you. We have no right to even come to you in prayer. But we acknowledge before you and praise you that those things are true because you are the God who saves us. And you saved us through the cross of your son, the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you that you went to that cross. You chose to do your Father's will to glorify him. You chose to take the punishment and by it we are saved. Please be with us this morning. Reveal more of uh, of yourself to us, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue in song, uh, singing about God's great salvation. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from the man yours veins and sinners blood beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all
Amen. Do take a seat. It is wonderful to praise Jesus together, isn't it? And we're going to do that into eternity. Um, if you ever get the chance to sit on the front row, do sit on the front row. The volume is just incredible. Uh, good morning. A formal welcome to you. My name is Sam. I'm a member here at King's Church, and it's lovely to see you here. Uh, whether you're a uh, part of our church family, you have been for many, many years, and whether you're brand new and you've just walked through the door and you're, this is your first Sunday, um, it is wonderful to see you here this morning. Um, if you are new, we'd love you to fill in one of these, just so we can uh, stay in touch with you, see how best we can support you. You can see one of these uh, on the back as you leave, or um, actually on the doors as you leave as well. So do grab one of these. Um, uh, in a short while, Mike, our senior pastor, will be continuing our series in John's Gospel from the Bible. We're going to sing, we're going to pray, we're going to hear God's Word, the Bible read to us. And we really want God to shape us this morning uh, to be who he wants us to be so that we can glorify him. Uh, now, kids, uh, you're going to go out to your groups in a, in, in a little bit. But before you do that, I just want to talk to you. But as always, with these kids' talks, they're for all of us, aren't they? Because they contain really important truths about the passage that we're going to be looking at in the service here this morning. And what I want us to think about this morning is uh, people who have jobs and what those jobs involve. Okay? People who have jobs and what those jobs involve. Really what, what their mission is, what their purpose is in those jobs. And Emma's going to help us. So Emma, if you come up here. And I want you to just work out these two questions. Who do you think uh, Emma is and what is she here to do? Who do you think she is? What is she here to do? Um, at the moment, she's just Emma. But let's, uh, let's have a few clues. So where's our first clue? Here we go. We've got some gloves. Uh, nice flowery pattern, a bit muddy, a bit muddy, Ems. Ooh, there you go. Um, so gloves with mud on. Uh, second clue, where's our second clue? Oh, thank you, Sophie, don't poke me in the eye. Whoa, there we go. There we go, you can have that. There you go. Second clue, here's our third clue. Oh, look at this. Whoa. <laughs> Oh, now, should we see how far this, this goes? Okay, Rob, I will cover your face. Ready? Three, two, where should we point it? Where should we point it? Wait, that's right, that way, right? Three, two, should we point your mic? Three, two, what? Nah, it's obviously not connected. I thought that'd be too disruptive. But there you go, you can hold that. And have we got a fourth clue, safe? Here we go. And this is a box of lawn seeds. Lawn seed, okay? So... Who do you think Emma is, and what do you think she is here to do? She arrived at your house with all of these things. Who do you think she is, and what do you think she'd be here to do? Uh, let's ch uh, shout out after three. Ready? Three, two, one. Gardener. gardener. Next slide, please. She is a gardener. Um, uh, Evan told me that we could call it a professional horticulturalist, if we want to say that. So there we go. There we go. Okay, we have a lot of expert gardeners in the church, but if they turn up like this at your house, they are there to sort out your garden. Okay, let's look at a couple more. Uh, next slide, please. This person, this person is a postie. Okay, and they are there. They turn up to deliver your post. Okay, Th next slide, please. This person is a firefighter. Okay, and if they turn up at your house in their fire engine with lights going, it's probably not very good. Okay, probably something is on fire and you need rescuing. All the cats up the tree. But let's assume uh, you need rescuing they're on fire. They have a different kind of hose that is a bit more powerful. Okay, so they're a firefighter, but their mission is to rescue you and to put out fires. Okay, the postman isn't just a postman. The mission is to deliver the post. A gardener isn't just a gardener, they're there for a mission, and their mission is to sort out your garden. Now, why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because uh, we've got to think about Jesus. If we go to the next slide, thinking this morning, we've got three people there. They have who they are, but also what their mission is. Who is Jesus, and what is Jesus' mission? And we come across these things in our passage today that Mike's going to be talking to the grown-ups about a little bit later. And we find out that as Jesus arrives... In Jerusalem, in a city, as he arrives, we find out who he is because the people shout it out. So if we go to the next slide, the people shout out this. They shout out, blessed is the king of Israel. Blessed is the king. We find out he's the king. What is he there to do? Something a little bit surprising, actually. Not something that most kings would do. What he is there to do is he's there to die for us. 
He's there to die for us. That is his mission. That is his purpose. He is there to die on the cross. If we go to the next slide, please. Jesus' mission is to die to save us. And in fact, he says, uh, he says, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. So he's saying, I'm not just here. I'm not just the king. I'm here for a mission, for a purpose. And that mission, that purpose is to die for people. Why? Because number one, I want to do what my father has asked me to do. And number two, because people need me to die for them. Like a firefighter with a house is on fire, they need me to rescue them. So as you go to your groups, think about that. Maybe have a chat uh, over lunch with your uh, mum or dad or someone at home and just say, what did you learn about who Jesus is and what his mission is? And we're going to sing a song now. And the song talks about who, what Jesus came to do. Kids, you're going to stay in for this whole song. Okay, you're going to stay in for the whole song. You know this song really well. I know you can sing it really well. You're going to stay in for the whole thing. Then I'm going to pray for you. Then you're going to leave for your groups. Uh, let's sing. Thanks, Dave. Lord, I lift your name on. So glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on. I lift your name on high Lord, I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth to show Lord, I lift your name on high. See, I'm going to pray for the kids now. Let's pray. Father, please would you be with all these children this morning and with their leaders as well. Please speak to them from your words, work in them through your spirit. Help them to be more like Jesus and to know Jesus better. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, kids, it's time for you to go out to your groups. We have groups all the way up to year six today, so that includes fusion. If you have any questions, anyone in the yellow lanyard at the back, anyone in the yellow lanyard, go and have a chat to them. Those of us left in the room, why not spend just a minute, chat to the people around you, find out something about them and how their week has gone.
Well, good morning, and let me add my welcome to the welcome you've already received. I'm Mike, one of the pastors here. I'm just going to make two quick announcements and then hand back to Sam. Um, the first is, today we're thinking about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And one of the very first things that uh, Jesus says we ought to do when we follow him is to be baptized. And at this church, that means we plunge you into a pool of tepid water until you are fully immersed. There's a rich meaning to it, but it's not immediately apparent. So we're going to be running a baptism and membership course here on Sunday evenings uh, from April 28th for four weeks. So normally on Sunday evening here at 6 p.m. we have a, 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 an evening meeting called Foundations. We, we do various studies. But from April 28th, we're going to be meeting at the far end of the building. And it's your chance to come and explore what it means to be baptized or be a member of this church. So if you've been baptized already, but you're not a member of the church and you'd like to be, we'd love to have you along as well. So come along, 6 o'clock, April 28th, uh, to the uh, far end of the building, and we'll talk about that. Now, I want to just see, are there any men in the room? Yes. Oh, come on. Are there any men in the room? Yes. There's a few, right. Now, we have a conference coming up called A Man's Greatest Challenge. There are two kinds of men, James. There are two kinds of men. There's men who admit they have a problem with self-control. And then there are liars. <laughs> you get to choose which one you are. Uh, a good friend of mine and one of the best communicators I know is a Welshman called Di Hankey. Only a Welshman could have a name like that. And he's agreed to come over to speak for us at this mini conference for men. Di is just an amazing bloke. He uh, is not only a church planter in some of the hardest parts of Wales, he also has set up and runs a coffee company that helps people who've been trafficked into human slavery to get free and have a job and work. And that's one of his things he does. He also writes books. He's written some kids' books. Uh, Eric Says Thank You. We, we watched a video of that a few months ago. He's, he's recorded rap albums. There's no end to his talents. He's, um, he's, and he's a really great bloke. So Di's written a book called A Man's Greatest Challenge. And we're, we're very fortunate to get him here to the King's Center for a half-day conference. So men, please come, wherever you are in your, in your journey. Uh, it uh, starts at noon on uh, Saturday, the 18th of May, and we'll be here for the afternoon and the first part of the evening. We'll have a meal together. And I can't believe the value of this conference. It is only five pounds. How do we do it? I don't know. I don't know how we do it. Probably by running a loss. But anyway, if you want to sign up, guys, for the Man's Greatest Challenge... At the end of this service, Kevin and Mark, you will spot them. They'll be hanging around there looking particularly manly. They will be able to sign you up for this conference. So please come. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Um, I do also sign up for the men's breakfast this coming Saturday morning. And a reminder, there's no evening service tonight. We start back next uh, Sunday evening with uh, one of our celebrated services, uh, which is always amazing. Um, so that means there's no evening service tonight. Maybe use that time, actually, um, maybe to pray, or maybe to read a good Christian book, or maybe to think back over this morning's passage or meet with another Christian. I think sometimes when, when we don't have the evening service, I find that a really useful uh, thing to do. We're going to turn to God in prayer now, um, and then we're going to listen to God's words read, and Gwyneth Hayden and Joe Ackhurst are going to help us in that. Thank you. So we're going to pause for a moment and come before God in prayer. And to do that, I'm going to start with some verses from Psalm 118, which is quoted in today's Bible reading. So let's pray. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever and all who fear God say his love endures forever the Lord is my strength and my song he has become my salvation you are my God and I will praise you you are my God and I will exalt you give thanks to the Lord for he is good 
His love endures forever. And then a verse from Psalm 118 and John 12, which we'll be reading later. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. We praise you this morning, Jesus the King, King of kings. You alone rule over the nations. You alone are sovereign over all things. You were exalted in the highest place. And yet you came in the name of the Lord, not as a conquering king, but as a humble servant. Though you are the immortal king and the source of all life, you came to die. The prophets of old searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to understand how the promised Messiah must suffer and how God would be glorified through this. This morning we celebrate your victory over sin and death because your suffering opened the way for our salvation. Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Please help us to see you afresh this morning, King Jesus, our Lord, who glorified his Father when he came to die. We have not loved you or served you or honored you as we ought. We have not loved one another. We fail to live as children of the King, but we remember that as well as majestic, you are merciful, compassionate and kind. You love rebellious and hopeless sinners and show us mercy and grace. We worship you, you are gracious and good, and your steadfast love endures forever. We pray for the church family. As we pray, we are conscious that there are those in our fellowship who are struggling, those who wake up daily to the reality of loss and an empty place at the table, those who are facing uncertainty in their health, those who are recovering from surgery, those who need new accommodation or are looking for work, those who are suffering the devastation of broken relationships. We pray for those who are going back to school tomorrow and especially for our young people facing significant exams. We thank you, gracious King, that you hear prayer. You know. You know our needs and you are with your people. Help these friends to especially know that you are good and your love endures forever. And we pray for the world. As we look at the wider world, we ache as we see the cruelty of war, the horrors that man inflicts on man, the devastation of famine and natural disasters. We live in a broken, hurting world. How we thank you, King Jesus, that you came to rescue and restore, knowing that to do this it was necessary for you to die. How grateful we are that one day you will bring in a new kingdom where there is no death or pain or suffering. And so this morning we say, open our eyes, Heavenly Father, we want to see Jesus. Warm our hearts as we consider him. Strengthen us to live for you. Bless Mike as he speaks and us as we listen. And we dare to ask this because you are glorious and good and your steadfast love endures forever. Amen. We're, we're going to have our Bible reading now. Um, if you don't have a Bible, then please just raise your hand and one of the stewards will bring one to you. Um, the reading this morning is from John chapter 12, and we'll be starting at verse 12. And if you have a church Bible, then you can find that on page 1079. John chapter 12, starting at verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion, see, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified 
did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the, Mos that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, You're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Let me pray briefly for Mike before he comes up to preach. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together today and hear from your word. We pray for Mike and that you be with him as he speaks to us. And Lord, please help us as well. Please help us to listen and please work in our hearts and lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks, Joe. That was a great reading. Please keep your Bibles open there at John chapter 12. I'm not going to preach just yet, though, because I want to introduce a friend to you, uh, Andy. Do you want to come up now? Now, if you've been around this church for a long time, some of us have, you might remember that in the 1980s, we prayed for the country of Albania. Can anyone remember doing that? Just put your hand up. Can you remember praying in Parbury Rise for the country of Albania? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few people remember it. We had a man who came. He was an Englishman, but he had a real heart for Albania. And he actually pulled this verse out from the end of Romans. Paul, the apostle, says that he preached the gospel as far around as Illyricum. And Illyricum is the, the states, Kosovo, Albania, and a few other states there. So we know that the apostle Paul himself went to Albania, but in the 1980s, it became the world's first atheist state. There was a dictator called Enver Hoxha who literally decreed that the end of religion in Albania and uh, it was taken out of school curricula. Kids were taught atheism. Priests were either imprisoned or sometimes killed. And Andy, uh, when we were praying those things in the late 1980s, you were a schoolboy. I was, I was born in 1980. So you were born into the period before Enver yeah. Hoxha? Yeah, uh, I myself lived five years before uh, he, when he died, uh, and remember all po people crying and uh, a big lamentation right. happened. I grew up uh, in a family, both my parents were teachers, and uh, 
I heard over and over again that God didn't exist. They have had this mission to raise a generation without God and without believing in God. That was their mission. And uh, in 90, 1992, the communism collapsed like in many other Eastern countries. And uh, the religion freedom was back. Uh, my old family from both sides uh, are Muslim, traditional Muslims. Uh, so the first thing I got to hear was uh, about the mosques and about Islam. So I went uh, one time to attend a mosque when I was 12. Yeah. And I couldn't understand anything because everything was in Arabic. So during my teen age years, I... Uh, had a dream to play football, like, professionally, which uh, uh, didn't last much because, or didn't come to reality because of uh, a civil uh, conflict, a civil war that happened in 1997. And that was a hit for me as a teenager that I couldn't, couldn't follow my, my dream. So I remember that time being... Uh, uh, given to alcohol and to started to smoke uh, and uh, I had another uh, dis big dis disappointment a year later when a very good friend of mine while he was diving uh, in shallow waters in the Adriatic Sea he uh, damaged his neck and remained paralyzed and that hit me a lot uh, I remember saying that if there was a Lord Oh God, uh, He wouldn't allow these things to happen. And uh, can I interrupt you? Yeah. So we were talking last night, and you describe yourself as quite angry, as a young man. And you were at one point at university, yep. and somebody said to you to come, a parent came and said to go and have words with their son because he was getting into a church, yep. and you went to sort him out, as we <laughs> would say. And what happened then? Yeah, I become very aggressive or rebellious had a broken relationship with my parents, my teachers. I was smoking 60 cigarettes a day, drinking a liter of alcohol every day. Those were 18 to 22. Right. So this one day I see this parent uh, being very worried about his son. I said, I'll go and uh, rescue him. He was very worried because he was going to church. I went and I threatened him literally that I would be his enemy if he doesn't stop today and go back to his dad and mom. Uh, so he quietly answered, talk, say to me, can I read you something? And read me a passage from the Bible I didn't know. And it was the corruption of the, the last days, how people would be in the last days. As he was reading... Uh, those uh, words fully described me as a sinner, as an egoistic lover of money and disobedient to parents and all of that. It was like screening my, my life. And I moved, to, I, I didn't talk more with him. I said, we'll talk again. But those words never left me. Uh, so I was dealing with that. Yeah. A few days later, he gave me a, a, a New Testament, which I didn't like it. I didn't want it, but uh, I wanted to read something and come to a conclusion that this is a, a man-made, created thing, story, made up, and just leave it there. Yeah. So it was uh, June tw 2002. I read the first Bible verse ever, and it was a verse from Romans saying, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. And uh, it was exactly what I was doing those days, eating, drinking, wasting, uh, ruining life of many people around me. But I had no peace, no joy, n nothing. And I remember saying a first prayer, Lord, if you care, if you are, if you really are, do something I can understand that you are dealing with uh, with me and uh, I was waiting for a, a last exam in university if that would be a, a negative one 
I would be heading to Germany to join a group of Albanians that they were selling drugs and involved in crime. They were inviting me to come because we're making quick money and lots of money. Most of them are still in prison today. But uh, it was in that particular moment that the Lord just intervened and rescued me and uh, saved me. I remember falling on my knees uh, uh, when I got a chance to continue the school. I got a positive answer from the teacher. It was a very strict teacher, in fact. I, it was 100% impossible to get another chance. <laughs> but the Lord was really gracious to answer me according to those requests. And I felt what broke my heart was that He, the eternal God, uh, maker of heaven, of earth, of everything that is on it, dealt with a young, broken man, yeah. a sinner in a, in a city from a very small family. And he, he dealt with me. He, he gave me attention and dignity. And uh, I don't know. He gave me s salvation. Yeah. Now, at some point, you then got in invited to this church. And you thought you were going to turn up to some like a cathedral kind of building. And what was it like when you got there? Yeah, this friend uh, was co uh, continuing to invite me to church. I said, I know the Lord exists. He, he answered me, but I want to go to mosque. He was insisting, come one time in a church, he said. I went. The church was completely different. It was like very, very sm a small house with uh, 15 people on it. But a community of love... Uh, I'd say this is, this is not real. It seems like a piece of heaven in the midst of Tirana. And I loved it immediately. I remember that day uh, a verse that the, the pastor shared was from John 14, 6, saying, uh, Jesus said, I am the, the way, the truth, the life. No one can go to Father except through me. And after the service, I ran to him and I said, why only Jesus? Why mm. not another prophet? Why is he so special? He said to me, it's a great uh, question to, to have coffee. <laughs> and we started to have conversations. But I remember reading the Gospel of John and still remember like it was today how the Holy Spirit was uh, putting in my heart yeah. all those truths and making sense, understanding how God is one God and in three persons, uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it was July 2002, I started to worship Him mm. as, a, as a triune God, as an eternal God. Yeah. So July 2020, 2002, the angry young man gets turned around. And here we are, 22 years later. You're married to the woman who was the, the singer of the worship group, Velma. Four sons, and you've planted a new church in Tirana, Light Church. Just tell us a little bit about that, the church. What's it like? Yeah, uh, I was a faithful member of a church for 13 years. But the, the need for more uh, churches, more communities of wor worshiping Jesus in, in our town and in our uh, country... Uh, stirred our hearts, and uh, I tell, told Vilma, what if we uh, start a new church, a new community of faith and worship here in our mi in midst of our neighborhood, which is very traditional Muslims, a very close community, and uh, we wanted to start where, uh, on the same community we were coming from, and embracing that challenge. So we've been planting that church in midst of that community for the last five years it hasn't been uh, a, an easy journey it took us uh, for some families more than 18 months to get a greetings from them hmm. i am with my son samuel he's here and we took a walk uh, we were in bridgend a few days ago in wells and and people w were greeting us and we enjoyed that so much. I say to him that it took us a lot to get a greeting uh, in our neighborhood. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, 
it's encouraging. Four people were baptized uh, last uh, fall. Wow. Among them, Samuel, that is with me, and three other, a mother and a, and a son baptized on the same day. God has been encouraging us. It's a small flock of 25, 30 people, but we believe the Lord will grow it, and uh, we'll, we pray to see many more churches like that planted in Tirana and throughout Albania. Yeah. Andy, thanks so much. What would be the number one thing we can pray for you? Yeah, w for me, it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege. It's a great encouragement to, to worship with, with you today. And uh, I shared with my, Mike last night, pray that uh, we see converted people. There are a lot of people unchurched or leaving churches, moving from a church to another church. But we want to see that new life of Christ coming to non-believers, to people that don't, don't know him. Mm. So new converted people, people that grow in the knowledge of Jesus, and new leaders being raised up, and new churches being played, planned or started. That would be the prayer request we, we need the most. Great. Thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to have you here. So Andy and Samuel will be around afterwards. Do grab them. Don't be shy. They're very friendly, and uh, it's such a pleasure. I'm going to pray for you now. Do, do have a seat. Let's, uh, let's pray, folks. Lord, we uh, want to praise you that uh, when you were lifted up on high, you drew all men and women to yourself. You are the king of this world, the rightful king and savior. There is no other. You are the way, the truth, the life. No one can come to the Father except through you. And we can see that testimony of Andy's life, how you drew someone who was really in the dark and furious at life and at you, and you reached in and changed him. And so we pray that you would show your power again, demonstrate your spirit's power in Albania, in every part of that country, by drawing people to Christ. Strengthen church leaders, Lord. It's very hard for them. Their hearts can be very heavy. Pray for refreshment for them, for unity, for humility, for grace. For those who come to the church as missionaries from outside to be very humble in how they deal with the local leaders. Protect your work there, Lord, please, and make Jesus glorious in that country. Amen. Please do turn back to John 12. We're in our series here in John's Gospel, and uh, we've reached this incredible passage during lockdown, I was uh, asked to speak to a local Cub Scout group. Group Cubs, if you don't know the Cubs, is a uniform movement for young children. It used to be boys. It's, it's mixed now. And these Cubs were working on a badge. Because in the Cubs, you get, a, you get a badge you put on your, your shirt of your uniform. Uh, different things. You, know, you can get the collector's badge and the sport badge. And they were working on the faith, the faith badge. And they'd asked various faith leaders from around the town to speak. And I was the uh, token pastor. So I found myself kind of scratching my head and thinking, How, what on earth do you say about Christianity in 20 minutes to a group of very lively 8 to 10-year-olds on Zoom? And on one level, I thought it's an impossible task. But on another level, I realized it's actually the simplest thing. Because you just have to tell them about Jesus. Christianity, it's all about him. It's about Jesus Christ. Uh, we think People tend to think about religion as a matter of rules. And there are things in the Christian faith to be obeyed. We have the Ten Commandments, the greatest expression of a moral life, a beautiful moral life that's ever been written, the Ten Commandments. Jesus boiled it down to two commandments, the, the laws of love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So we do have rules, but it's not the heart of it. We often think about religion as a matter of rituals. And we do have ritual. We have baptism. We've talked about that. We're going to have a baptism service, God willing, at the end of, uh, beginning of July. We have the Lord's Supper. We practice that at least monthly here. But that's not what it's primarily about. It's not primarily about the rules or the rituals. It's primarily about a relationship with a person, Jesus Christ. A real relationship with a real person. But it is a very, it's a particular kind of relationship. And it's important for all of us to see this. 
See, being a Christian means following Jesus. He's the leader. He leads. We follow. We don't just opt in to various things that we like. We obey and submit our lives to him. See, that's a different kind of relationship. He's the Lord. We're the disciples. And we follow the way he went. We follow his path. And his path was the way of the cross. So you start to sense the gravity of what it means to follow Jesus. And it will take you in a direction that nowhere, nothing else will. The Bible often speaks about following Jesus in terms of believing. We've been in this book of John for a few, few weeks now. John has a really famous verse. It's been translated. I think this verse has been translated into more languages than any other verse in the Bible. And that means any other piece of writing in the world. Okay? This, this one verse. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. It's a verse that speaks of God and his love and his son and believing in him. So what kind of believing is it? We've got to be careful to understand that what the Bible means by the language of belief is quite different from what we often think of as believing. If the essence of being a Christian is believing in Jesus, what kind of belief is it? Now, as you read the Bible, you find it's much more than saying something like, I believe in Henry VIII. Do you believe in Henry VIII? Anyone here believe in Henry VIII? Put your hand up. I mean, you believe in Henry VIII. You can visit Henry VIII's house. It's 15 minutes drive from here. We believe he existed. It makes no difference to our lives. Right? Believing in Jesus is not simply the acknowledging of a historical fact. Believing in Jesus means all of you goes in. You trust and obey him. You accept his words as authority in your life. You commit your whole way to him. You bet your life on him. And you imitate him. You obey him in all things. So being a Christian is about following Jesus. And so what this means today is that the one thing we really need to see this morning is see Jesus. So that we can follow him. I know we're all coming from very different places. We're from different parts of the world. I know we've all got different stuff going on in our lives. Some of you are struggling with huge issues. So I don't say it lightly or, or superficially that the one thing we all need today is to see Jesus more clearly. It's summed up in our passage. If you look at, open at page 1080, some Greek people come to uh, the festival, but they really want to meet Jesus. And they say in verse 21, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. So that translation is actually quite polite. It's probably more like this. We want to see Jesus. We want to see him. That's what we need. That's what we need. And people are still asking this question. Nicky Gumbel is an Anglican minister. He's based in London. He's the founder of the Alpha Course, popular introduction to the Christian faith. And in an article in the Times newspaper, he said how younger people, Generation Z, Gen Z, are more and more open to spiritual concerns and seeking Christian answers than the generations before them. Over 20 million people are reckoned to have taken the Alpha course. And the average age? 27. People are still asking. We want to see Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus. So we're going to spend our time this morning in this worthwhile pursuit. We see three things about Jesus in this passage. Do you know, I've been reading this this week. I'm kind of like, oh, I'm such an idiot. I really am. There could have been three sermons here. And we only have to, we could do them in one. He's a new kind of king. He's the grain that must die. And he's the son who is glorified. The king, the grain, the son. Firstly, the king. Uh, it's picking up chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. There's this, I just want to kind of try and enter this scene for a minute because there's one time in the, in the year, in the annual calendar of, the, of Judaism at this time that was the, it was the, uh, the busiest, the most exciting 
the most powerful time, and it was this festival, the Passover festival, and the city would be swelled, its normal population massively increased by the presence of pilgrims who've traveled not just from around Israel, but actually they traveled from around the known world for this festival. Jewish people would travel from long ways. And it's an exciting time and emotions run high. But this year, of all years, there's an extra dimension because everyone is talking about Jesus. News has been spreading about him for three years. Now it's reached the next level. Not long before, Jesus has literally raised a man from the dead. And this man has come back to life and is alive and well. His name is Lazarus. And a crowd of people from Jerusalem actually saw it happen. And then more people went out to verify the story because they couldn't believe it. And they've come back and they are all spreading the word. So in verse 17 of our passage, it says, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. And this has got excitement to fever pitch. People are speculating, where is Jesus? Is he coming to the festival? And finally the word gets out. He's on his way. He's coming. And that prompts the most extraordinary scene because there's this great crowd in verse 12 that has come for the festival. And now, at last, here is Jesus. Now, he normally walks, very humble, but this time he's riding on a young donkey, specially chosen, carries the dignity of a visiting king or prophet, And the other gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they add some extra details for us. People started cheering. And they were throwing their cloaks on the ground for the donkey to walk over. And some of them had run to the palm trees in the fields. And they cut down green foliage. And they're waving it like banners. Just as other people had done centuries before at the coronation of a king. And the crowd swells and swells. And people are running and they want to see And now they're shouting, Hosanna, or as we would sing, Hosanna. What does it mean? Save, in their language. And they're quoting the Bible, Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they're adding these words, very important. Blessed is the King of Israel. You see what's happening here? They think he's a a conquering king, a returning king, coming in triumph. And they're actually right. What's Jesus doing? Normally he's so discreet. This time he's going all in. It's an acted parable. One scholar calls it a political street theater. Because everyone who knows their Bible knows what this means. They know the words of the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, which says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout! Daughter Jerusalem, see, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus is making a bold statement here in public. The king is coming home. And this is no ordinary king. The very next verse in Zechariah chapter 9 proclaims this is the final king, God's king, the one who will set the whole world to rights. This is what Zechariah 9 says in verse 10. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. You don't need it anymore. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. It's the whole world. And from the river to the ends of the earth. Riding in on a young donkey is a message to the city leaders and to everyone else. The king has come home. The king. But notice the unique nature of this king. He's a king like no other. Two things combine in Jesus in an extraordinary way. Absolute authority and complete humility. He's the lion and the lamb. Absolute authority. He's shown this throughout John's gospel. Changing water into wine. Healing people at a distance. Feeding 5,000 people with a packed lunch. Walking on water. Giving sight to the blind. Finally, raising Lazarus from the dead. And his teaching 
his claims about himself, the things he says are as different from any other human teacher as night is from day. He's the king. Other people may say, God is like this, but Jesus says, I am. The Old Testament prophets say, thus says the Lord. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. Do you get what he's saying? He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, the life. Andy, those words you heard, 2002, at that little church in Tirana. Absolute authority. And yet, combined with it, and no less than it, complete humility. Gentle and lowly is how he described himself. It's even demonstrated by his mode of transport. A conquering king would have come in on a chariot or a battle horse, you know, a great white steed with a procession of people behind and slaves at the back. Here's Jesus. We know he's got awesome power, great popularity. People will rally to his cause. And here he is riding in on a young donkey. He's so humble. It doesn't just fulfill a prophecy. It speaks a powerful world about, about the nature of his kingdom which is meek and gentle and lowly. So in Jesus we see a unique combination of meekness and majesty that is absolutely unparalleled in anyone else in the world. He is the servant king. He's the lion and the lamb. He embodies what he has taught, that the greatest of all must be the servant of all. Amen? He's the king. That's the first thing we see when we want to see Jesus. We see a king. But what a king he is. But the second thing we, re- we see is, is if, if the king was surprising, surprising, the next thing should be stunning. The next thing we see is that the, he is a grain. And the grain must die. Let's pick up the story in verse 19. The Pharisees, a group of leaders, said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. An ironic statement, because it was much truer than they thought. The whole world was going after him, and he's been drawing the whole world to himself ever since. As far around as Illyricum. The whole world is going after him. And, 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 and as if in fulfillment, the very next verse shows that some people have traveled quite a long way to come to this festival, because they are described as Greeks. Greeks, we don't know how they came to be there. They perhaps had heard about the Israelite religion and become believers, what are called God-fearers. And they've made their way to the Passover, to the biggest festival in the calendar. But they really want to see Jesus. And verse 23 is absolutely fascinating. If you want to look for, uh, look in your Bible here, John 12, 23. They say, we would like to see Jesus. And he replies, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Oh. Uh, that looks a bit of a, of a change of subject, doesn't it? Now watch what he says next. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. Something weird is happening here. Some guys come and they say, they come to the dis- Philip, Jesus' disciples from the start. Sir, we want to see Jesus. And Philip goes and tells them and they come to Jesus. And he replies... The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. What is he saying? Firstly, he's saying this is the hour, the time, for him to be glorified, to be made glorious. To be given the weight and the majesty that he deserves. And we've had hints about this hour in John's Gospel. Right back in the first miracle water into wine, when Mary went to her son, Jesus, and said, they, they've run out of wine. And Jesus said, why are you troubling me? My hour has not yet come. There's a hint there. There's something ominous about this hour in the future. But finally here, in chapter 12, we find the hour has come. And it's as if when Jesus heard these Greeks ask the question, he hears a clock chime. The hour has come. The moment that we've all been waiting for, 
the culmination of years of preparation, the final act that he came into the world to accomplish has come. And what is it? He must die. That's what it's all about. That's where it's heading. Verses 23 and 24, again, just try and track the logic here. Verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. See the logic? Glorifying and dying are linked together inextricably. And if that's still a little bit obscure for us, we have an interpretation further down, verses 32 uh, and following. Jesus said, I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. When he's lifted up from the earth, it's ta he's talking about a cross. When he's lifted up on the cross, he will draw people to himself. He's talking about his death. In other words, this is the climax the crescendo, the apex, the high point, the culmination, the conclusion. He must be lifted up on a cross. He must die. But, he says, like a grain of wheat, by dying he will produce a great harvest. A global people will be gathered, rescued from death, and brought into his kingdom of life and light. A kingdom of people so many that you couldn't even count them. But if he does not die, there will be no harvest. There's a great scholar and writer, I've quoted him a few times here, called Tom Wright. He talks about playing, uh, playing with conkers as a boy. Now, if you're not from the British Isles, you might wonder what a conker is. It's a, also known as a horse chestnut. It's inside a kind of green casing, but there's this brown nut. It's very hard. And when we were kids, we would always get that, something like a skewer or some drill bit or something and put, drill a hole through the conker and get a string. Probably can't do it anymore because of health and safety. <laughs> but let me tell you, it was fun. And you'd have your conker on the end of the string and you'd, you'd get someone else's conker. So James, you'd have a conker and I'd go, and it, he's done it. He knows what I'm talking about. And then I'd hold mine up, and then you'd try and smash it, and that's what conquers were for. But Tom Wright says that uh, one year he decided to plant one, just as a boy. And he took one of the best ones, dug a hole, put in some sand and water, and stuffed the conquer as far down as he could and covered it with soil. It seemed like an absolute waste of a good conquer. Next year, he went back in the spring, there was a tiny little shoot there in the woods. The year after, there was the beginning of a small sapling. Over 50 years later, he went back to that place. And guess what? There's a great tree bearing hundreds of horse chestnuts. But for that to happen, the first one had to die, didn't it? Go into the ground. Jesus says, I'm going to be a grain that goes and I'm lifted up. I will die. I will be buried. I will, I will I will, I will be totally dead, but unless I die, I will remain a single seed. He's the king. What a kind of king he is. He's the grain that must die. Are we starting to see Jesus this morning? But there's more. Many of us, I think, here are familiar with the teaching so far. You're familiar with the wonder of Jesus as king, lion, and lamb. You're familiar about the need for his sacrificial death. Some of you probably got that with your mother's milk. But there's an extra nuance in our passage today we mustn't miss. It's, I, I think it's, it's almost unique to John's gospel. It's a rare window into the emotional life of our Lord. And it's there in verse 27. Jesus says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? My soul is troubled. This word troubled means deeply distressed. Churned up, stirred up. It's a word that's used of water being roiled and churned up and all unsettled. Jesus was deeply troubled right down in the core of who he was, in, in his heart. The one who would come into the world, the Prince of Heaven, full of grace and truth. The Lord of all creation. The one with such extraordinary power and dignity and authority. 
the one who, who, who went to the broken person and fixed them, who went to the, the, the sick person and healed them, who went to the troubled person and relieved them. This one, such beautiful, the greatest person who ever lived, he's deeply troubled, he's distressed at the core of his being. Why? Because he's thinking about the cross. That's why. Now, over Easter, we looked into the Garden of Gethsemane. That's in a, another place. But this moment here is even earlier than that. This is just as poignant, right in the middle of the triumphal entry. Right in the middle of all the shouts and all the happiness and the joy and the palm branches. Even at this moment of apparent triumph, Jesus' heart is deeply troubled because he knows what's coming. He's fully human. And he doesn't, in his, in his flesh, want to go to a cross. So what will he do about it? I don't know what you do when you feel deeply troubled. We all develop different strategies in life, don't we? Some of us uh, hide it with busyness. Some try to heal it with talking, friends, family, therapists. Some spend money. Some run away. Some self-medicate, numb it. We, find, we try and find any and every way of dealing with a troubled heart. It's the one thing we can't bear. What does Jesus do? Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This is the very reason I came into the world, says Jesus. I've come all this way. He's prepared the ground. He's spoken of the Father's will. He's told us how the world is going to be saved. Is he going to ask for plan B now? No. His troubled heart knows that there is danger ahead. But he knows that it's through that danger, rather than by trying to slide around it safely, that the glory will shine out. So he prays, Father, glorify your name. May you be made great and famous and loved and glorious through my suffering. And God replies. <laughs> you know, there's very few occasions in the New Testament where God speaks from heaven. The baptism of Jesus, his transfiguration, and here's the third one. And when the Father speaks, he speaks from the fullness of his love for the eternal Son, the one and only Jesus now made flesh. And here on the eve of that darkest hour, when Jesus speaks plainly of his deep distress, the Father sees it. And when Jesus resolutely proclaims, I'm not backing away from this, it's as if the Father sees it and he cannot contain his love and pride. And he speaks, a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Some people said that it was thunder. Others said it was an angel. But Jesus says, this voice is for your benefit. Listen now. God says that he has glorified himself in Jesus' career. And now he will glorify it himself in Jesus' death. Because now God is going to deal with all the evil in the world. God is going to deal with all the exploitation and the, the vileness, all the misery of our Race. God is going to find those who have trampled on people and exploited them and laid his creation waste, who've lived for themselves and destroyed others, who've been lovers of self and haters of others, and all of them are going to be judged and found guilty. Because now at this final hour, Jesus is going to bring salvation, judgment on this world and judgment on the enemy of God and God's people Satan, the devil, will be driven out. And, sit, and as Satan is dethroned, Jesus is enthroned at the cross. And millions and millions of people from all around this world will be gathered to Jesus and join his family from every tribe, every language group, every nation. A multitude that you can't number. Dictators have set themselves up and exercised their most cruel and wicked tyranny 
to shut this message out, as happened in the country of Albania. And what do we find now? The dictator is gone, dead and buried. Churches are springing up. Jesus will have his glory. So, what does it mean for us? Remember how we started today with a simple definition of being a Christian is one who follows Jesus. Being a Christian is about following him, and we've seen, we've seen things about him. We've seen that he's the king, the lion, the lamb. We've seen that he's the grain, the one who must die. We've seen that he's the son, the obedient son who will honor the father. And so at the heart of this passage, I'm gonna, we're going to close on this. We're going to try and land the plane here. You're going to hear the biggest challenge that you've ever heard in your life. I hope you've got your seatbelt on. Verse 25 to 26. This is the, uh, the, the takeaway, the real world value of it. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, says Jesus. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. The last time I preached on this passage, it was actually during the lockdown. We were only allowed out of the house for one walk a day. My wife and I were walking around Manchester and I shared this verse. And so I've got to preach on this. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it. Whoever serves me must follow me. And she said, my wife is a very honest person, by the way. Not one to gild the lily. She said, no one wants to hear that. <laughs> She's right. No one will accept that. And no one will believe it because no one wants it. And I said, do you want to say anything else? <laughs> I was afraid. I was afraid to preach it because I was, I was afraid that she was right. Is this what we're saying here today? Anyone who loves their life will lose it and anyone who hates their life will keep it. Whoever serves Jesus must follow him where he goes, which is to the cross. Is that what the take home is today? It's a big problem for a preacher, isn't it? Do you know, as I've studied this more and more, I've come to realize, I think, how this works. If you only looked at Jesus' challenge on its own, it would make no sense to you. It would be completely insane, wouldn't it? If you only looked at Jesus' challenge on its own, because Christianity is ultimately not a method to achieve human flourishing. Christianity is not a means for us to access God, to help us with our personal brand and project. It's not what's being offered here. Listen to the words of New York pastor John Stark. Christianity is not a means to human flourishing. In fact, Christianity instructs us to die to ourselves, to consider others more important, to turn the cheek, to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, to enter into weeping and sadness with other people, this, of course, creates a conflict with the modern self. You think? It's insane. Because this challenge makes no sense if you haven't seen Jesus. It makes no sense. Huh. But if you have seen him, if you've seen the kind of king he is, If you've seen, in spite of his extraordinary kingship, he says, I've come as a grain to die, to release this harvest of beyond counting. If you've seen him facing down the challenge of his own troubled heart and saying, shall I turn back from this hour? No. This is why I came. Father, glorify yourself in me. If you've seen Jesus, then it puts it all into perspective for you. Because this morning, we're not inviting you to embrace an idea, but a person. This morning, we're not calling you to a religion, but to a person who is the lover of your soul. His name is Jesus. Great Scottish preacher Alexander McLaren wrote this, The true characteristic of Christian teaching as to behavior lies in this, that the law is in a person, and that the power to obey comes from the love of the person. All things are different because of this. 
Unwelcome duties are made less repulsive. Hard tasks are lightened. Sorrows are made tolerable. If only we are following him. Amen. McLaren tells the legend of Robert the Bruce's final wish was that his heart would be buried in Jerusalem. This is kind of the 14th century. The king's heart was placed in a silver casket and entrusted to a loyal knight, Sir James Douglas. With a band of knights, Sir James set off to go to the Holy Land with this casket. And en route, they were outnumbered and attacked by enemies. Sir James saw that he was likely going to die. And he threw the silver casket into the midst of the enemies. And he cried out, go on, I follow you. (laughs) The king's heart. The love of his king spurred him to see death itself as a little thing. So let me ask friends, will you take up the challenge to follow Jesus Christ today on the path of the cross? Because he does not want anything else or less from you. He said, follow me, and everything is melted down into that. That's the essence of his call on our lives. Over the centuries, many people, thinkers, philosophers, religions, tried to crystallize the system into a simple formula. Ancient people said, follow nature. Other people have said, follow duty. Modern people say, follow your heart. But Jesus Christ says, follow me. That is enough for life. So are we following? We can easily reduce this to Christian service. Am I doing my spot on the rotor? We can reduce this to doing good deeds in the community. Those are all fine, but at its heart, Jesus is calling us to sacrifice ourselves by becoming more like him, conforming our character to his character. That's the depth of what he calls us to. If anyone serve me, let him sing and praise and pray, yeah. If anyone serve me, let him try to help other people, yeah. But deeper than all and fundamental to all the rest, if anyone serve me, let them follow me, says Jesus. Is, my, is that my discipleship? Let each one of us here today, professing Christians, ask ourselves, am I following Jesus. And if I'm not, and if my steps have slipped, great, you're here now, you can change today. Because you heard his voice calling you today. And as we close, and we're going to sing again, let us see that in this great person that we follow, we have a completely satisfying hope for the future. Verse 26 holds a promise. Where I am, my servant also will be. Whatever lies ahead in your life, Whatever you're facing, now or in the future, whatever trials will come, and they will, however you cross the river of death and into the kingdom, whatever waits for you, this promise is enough. Where I am, my servant also will be. It's a promise. Let's pray. If it dies, it produces many seeds. Lord, thank you that we've seen that in our lives. We've seen it in history. See it in this room. Your death has produced many seeds and many people here whose lives have been turned around and changed and are being changed because of your death. You call us to follow. We know we find it hard to follow. We ask, Lord, refresh our vision again. Confirm and establish and strengthen us. And Lord, I pray for this this morning, there might be someone here who knows that they've not yet followed you, but they know they need to now. Help them to take that step, please. For them to be bold enough to tell someone and for us to be kind enough to show them the way. Amen. We're going to sing uh, to end. One of our responses is that we're lost in wonder. Um, And we're going to sing about uh, the king who chose uh, the cross. He chose the cross for me, but he also chose the cross 
for you. And if that's something that you uh, don't know uh, personally, please don't leave without speaking to someone or uh, coming before the Father in prayer uh, this morning. Let's stand, let's sing, uh, Lost in Wonder. every breath, the perfect life, the perfect death. You chose the cross, the crown of thorns you wore for us, crowned us with eternal life. You chose the cross, and though your soul was overwhelmed, Death you overcame. I'm lost in wonder. I'm lost in love. I'm lost in prayer. Do you take a seat. Thank you. It's been great to meet with you this morning. Um, if you have children in the children's group, please can you go and get them uh, as soon as we are finished. Um, and just echo what Dave said, please speak to someone at the end. If there's anything, any questions you have from this morning, or you, th you think you're coming to believe something that you've never believed before about the Lord Jesus, I'll be at the door on the way out. You can speak to Mike. I'm sure you can speak to Dave as well. Some words from Hebrews as we finish. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Have a good day. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well the spirit is within me because you died and rose again 
amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? 